So picking up <clears throat> with the signal that comes in from the nerve. Okay, so signal coming in from the nerve. That signal comes down, enters into the synapse. That triggers voltage-gated calcium channels to open. Calcium rushes in the cell because it's going down its concentration gradient. It's high calcium outside, low calcium inside. And then through a series of molecular mechanisms, acetylcholine is going to, uh, vesicles containing acetylcholine are going to dock on the membrane, are going to form a pore and release that acetylcholine out here into the synaptic cleft. So that signal as it comes in, triggers the opening of sodium channels. So we trigger the opening of sodium channels, and sodium rushes into the cell down its concentration gradient. The brackets, remember that's concentration, and then GRAD just represents gradient. So concentration gradient is how you're going to read that abbreviation. Now, with that rush of sodium into the cell, the cell instantaneously becomes increasingly positive. This is called depolarization. Now, nearly at the same time, we're also going to have potassium channels that open up. Nearly the same time as the sodium channels open up, potassium channels open. And potassium floods into the extracellular fluid out of the intracellular fluid. <clears throat> now, there are two reasons for this outward flow. <clears throat> Part of it is that sodium is rushing into the cell, which makes it more positive. And whenever positives are by positives, they repel each other. Similar charges repel, right? So it's going to be repelled by the positive charges of the sodium channel. The other mechanism at play here is it's just simply down its concentration gradient. So if I were to draw this out, now again, this is what's going on inside of the nerve, right? So the nerve, we got to have calcium enter the cell to cause all this other stuff to happen here. 
So to get the calcium channels open up, we're going to bring a signal in. To bring that signal in, we have to depolarize the, the membrane patches that are nearby those calcium channels. Signal comes in through this mechanism of calcium, or I'm sorry, of sodium rushing out, potassium rushing back in. So if we're to draw out the membrane voltage at that little patch of membrane by that calcium channel, so this is time, and then this is my millivolts here. Minus 70 is the resting membrane potential for a <coughs> neuron, a nerve, and so sodium channels open up, it becomes increasingly positive, and then the potassium channels decrease, causing repolarization, okay? This is a signal that's basically the result of current. So with potassium rushing out of the cell, the inside of the cell returns to being negative, returns to being negative in a process called repolarization. So repolarization. This whole thing of sodium and then potassium channels opening up, changing the voltage characteristics of the membrane, the whole cycle is referred to as an action potential. An action potential. And an action potential forms that typical waveform that looks something like that is a reference to a little tiny small patch of membrane. And as the membrane goes through its depolarization and changes its current characteristics, that signal gets passed on to the neighboring patches of membrane. It gets passed on to the neighboring passes, patches of membrane. And what you can see here is we're actually propagating the signal along a neuron or other types of cell, much the same as a wire would pass the electrons through a light bulb to turn a light bulb on. So perpetuation, the action potential moves along the membrane. <coughs> the action potential moves along the membrane. And it moves along the membrane from point of origin upward. Kind of like if I were to throw a rock into a pond where the rock hits is analogous to the point of stimulation and then there are ripples that kind of float outward. The action potential moves from that point of stimulation along the membrane. Does this make some sense? Does everybody kind of get what's going on here? So it's not ripples in a pond, but rather it's changes in voltage along the membrane. So changes in voltage along the membrane. And we can refer to this as just simply an impulse. Okay, so this impulse is generated, and really this is what gives us the ability to do work. This is creating our current and gives us the ability to do work. So just to kind of give you a little bit of a, of a synopsis here of what's going on. This is our nerve. This is going to be our muscle cell. If I need this muscle cell to contract, I'm going to begin an impulse moving down the nerve, and it's initiated someplace in the central nervous system, either the spinal cord or the brain for most of our muscles. There are some that come from the brain for our, our facial muscles, but most of them are actually from the spinal cord. And that signal, again, this is my membrane. So let's go ahead and, and take a look at that patch of membrane. I'm going to blow that patch of membrane up. Make it bigger, not. Okay, so there's our patch of membrane. 
this is going to be my intracellular fluid. This is going to be my extracellular fluid. Okay? The muscle is over here. Central nervous system is over here. Other side of the axon would be here. So we're moving towards the synapse down here. Okay? Tell me what's my ion distribution like? Sodium, huge out here in the extracellular fluid. How about potassium? Small. Okay, potassium. Huge potassium here, and then sodium. Small sodium here. So that would be my resting membrane potential. My signal comes in from the central nervous system, and we get to this patch of membrane. And by the way, the signal that's coming in here is going to be changes in voltage from neighboring membrane, right? It's kind of a domino effect in a lot of ways. So we're at this patch of membrane, and we're ready to depolarize this patch of membrane. In this membrane, I'm going to have two different types of channels. One is going to be a sodium channel. One is going to be a potassium channel. The sodium channel is going to open up right around minus 40 millivolts, and it opens up really, really quick. The gate opens up really, really quick. And it's kind of like opening up a door. I can open that door really quick. And if you were all concentrated right here, a couple of you have been able to make it out before it closed, right? Okay. Potassium channel, it opens up as well. It actually opens up a little bit closer to zero, a um, little before that. But what happens is it opens up much slower. <laughs> so it's going to open up much, much slower. It's still going to swing all the way open, but... This one, sodium channel opens up really fast. The potassium channel opens up really, really slow. So by the time the sodium channel's opened up really, really fast, what happens? It's not three. That's the sodium-potassium pump. We're dealing with sodium channels. These are different proteins. There's an X that's like all going to rush in and spell. There's going to be a lot of... Okay, sodium rushes into the cell in that amount of time for it to swing open really fast, and then it swings back short. What's going to happen to charge inside the cell? Because remember, overall it's negative because there's immovable anion. So what's happening to charge here? Becoming more positive. So if we were to draw this out again just to give you that graph, resting membrane potential, sodium begins to leak into the cell. Then potassium channels fully open, sodium's closed now. What happens here? Potassium channel's open, potassium's going to pour out. So now if potassium is pouring out, positive charges are leaving, what's happening to the charge in the intracellular fluid? I heard mumbling. It's going to start to slip back towards more negative. Not even close there, whatever. So it becomes more negative. That's an action potential. And the changes here, this patch of membrane causes the action potential to form, that's a change in voltage. That change in voltage down over here in the neighboring patch of membrane, there's two more voltage-gated ion channels. They are affected by that change in voltage from this patch of membrane. And so that patch of membrane depolarizes. And we go all the way down, moving along the membrane until we get to the synaptic knob. Is the extracellular fluid change voltage is the Extracellular fluid really doesn't change perceptibly. And the reason that is, is because there's so much more extracellular fluid around. Inside the cell, we're talking about a discrete packet of fluid. So as the sodium and potassium cross the membrane, you have a lot smaller volume that you're affecting versus the extracellular fluid that's surrounding it. Besides, changing the extracellular fluid really isn't all that important. It, it doesn't matter if it changes all that much or doesn't change at all, just because we want to know what's going on inside the cell. So now, once we get down to the synapse, so here's my synapse, here's my muscle cell, we're going to have calcium channels, and so that signal comes in, we have depolarization that's occurring all the way along. These are terrible. Whatever. So depolarization occurs all the way along. 
I now have a change of voltage here. This causes the calcium channel to open up. Voltage gated, the gate swings open. Anyone remember calcium concentrations? High on the outside. So it's high on the outside, and then it's low on the inside. So that gate opens, calcium rushes into the cell. Now, in this case, there is a change in voltage that occurs because we're dumping a bunch of positive calcium inside, but that change in voltage isn't as important as what's happening with the molecular mechanisms. The proteins that are involved in taking those acetylcholine receptors and docking them up to that basal membrane surface, they respond to calcium. One group of those are called snares. The other group of those proteins are called snaps. Snares and snaps come together to help that vesicle dock up uh, on the membrane. So just to maybe give you a little bit of a picture of what that may look like. So this is the a patch of the membrane. And here comes our vesicle loaded up with our acetylcholine. There are going to be proteins that engage that vesicle and bind up to it and help dock it up or attach it to the, the membrane. The vesicle will be able to attach up to the membrane. And then what happens is this is also a phospholipid bilayer. That's just what a vesicle is. is it's a bilayer. Uh, it's a membrane bilayer. It's a packet filled up with something. In this case, acetylcholine. And that membrane, through the action of the snares and the snaps, allows that vesicle to form a pore and basically to separate oops, to separate that membrane so that we form a force for those acetylcholine molecules now to begin to empty up exocytosis. Okay, so our signal comes down to the synapse, calcium rushes into the cell. We have the molecular mechanisms that help acetylcholine to leave the cell. Now, acetylcholine, so here's my nerve, this is my muscle membrane. Acetylcholine levels are increasing inside of the uh, inside of the synaptic gap. And those acetylcholine receptors, they're going to bind two acetylcholine molecules. These acetylcholine receptors are ligand-gated sodium channels. Ligand-gated sodium channels. So what does that mean? What does it mean to be ligand-gated? You bind a ligand. What's the ligand? You know... What binds to the acetylcholine receptor? Acetylcholine. Acetylcholine released from the vesicles binds to the acetylcholine receptor. That's why we call it the acetylcholine receptor. When, whenever a protein binds and is bound by something, what happens to that protein? Changes its shape. Changes its, shape, which changes its function. Without acetylcholine bound up here on, without acetylcholine here bound up on the acetylcholine receptor, it's closed and the membrane's not permeable. Then we add in two acetylcholine molecules drawn there in red. And those acetylcholine molecules are the ligands that bind the protein that cause the protein to change its shape. When the protein changes its shape, if this is Let's try that again. If this is a patch of membrane and this is the acetylcholine receptor, so you're looking down on it now, you're not looking crosswise, you're looking as if you're looking at that surface. That's what it's going to look like. And then when it's not activated, and then we'll have our two acetylcholine receptors that bind up on it. And it has a change in shape, a change in function that creates a core and opens up, changes in such a way that it makes a pathway through the membrane. Now I said that the acetylcholine receptor was a ligand-gated sodium channel. 
we now understand what a ligand is. Ligand is acetylcholine. A ligand is just simply something that binds a receptor. That's a very generic term that we use. So whenever um, we have um, a hormone like insulin binding the insulin receptor, the insulin is the ligand. Okay, a ligand is something that binds to a receptor. If the receptor is a channel, it's a ligand-gated channel, the ligand binds to open up the gate to cause that pore to be formed to allow something to cross. It's a channel, so it opens up a pathway through the membrane. It's a sodium channel. What's going to cross? Sodium. So if this is my membrane here, okay, here's our, our muscle membrane right here. All right, we're drawing our phospholipid bilayer. Sodium channel opens up. What's going to happen? Sodium does what? Sodium rushes in because we have high sodium outside, low sodium inside. Sodium begins to rush into the cell. Now, what's happening to the fluid right here? Becoming increasingly positive. We're changing voltage. There's more sodium channels that are located out here along the edges along the edges of the membrane that are not ligand gated sodium channels. They are voltage gated sodium channels. So this change in voltage occurring right here affects that first channel there. Sodium rushes in. What's happening to that patch of fluid right there? Becoming more positive. Affects that sodium channel there. What's happening now to that patch of membrane? What's that? More positive. And why is it becoming more positive? Because sodium is rushing in. And it's kind of this chain of events or chain, uh, uh, chain reaction that occurs. And the signal begins to move out from the synapse along the membrane. Yeah. If the sodium rushes in like it does, how does the inside of the cell kind of become negative here? Sodium potassium pumps. So the sodium is going to be pumped back out. We will recover the back to the resting membrane potential. So now that we have moved that signal out, we have Sodium channels that line the membrane and that channel or that signal begins to permeate outward from our point of origin at the neuromuscular junction. So that impulse comes in to cause calcium to help release acetylcholine. Acetylcholine initiates the sodium response in the membrane of the muscle. And that sodium begins to, uh, the sodium channels begin to depolarize and we move along the membrane as is being shown here with these arrows, okay? And that's going to perpetuate as long as we have sodium channels that can respond to the changes in voltage by the neighboring sodium channels. So we haven't uh, even made it to really any sort of muscle contraction yet. Um, we've, we've spent maybe three or four hours talking about this now. And everything that we've talked to up to this point, let them know a second time. Isn't that incredible? If you really think about that, it's taken me four or five hours to describe what's going on in one millisecond inside of a cell. If you are not convinced that God is amazing, I hope that this is tugging at your heart right now. The God of this universe created this so that all of us can live. All right, so we're ready to now contract the muscle. Muscle contraction comes in four phases. Okay, so four phases. You're going to need to know these four phases in order. We've already talked quite a bit about excitation. We're going to talk a little bit more about it here in just a second. That's going to be the first phase. 
And then the next phase is excitation, contraction, coupling. That word right there is supposed to be contraction. Excitation, contraction, coupling. And what that means, coupling just means coming together. You know, you and your boyfriend or you and your girlfriend couple together on Friday nights to go for a day. If you're me and my wife, we couple together to put our kids to bed. We're head over to Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> so excitation, contraction, coupling takes events of excitation and couples it to contraction. So what do you think my third phase is going to be? Contraction. And then the fourth phase, the fourth and final phase, is just simply going to be relaxation. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of a primer here on relaxation. I'm about to contract my bicep. So in that process of contracting my bicep, we're going to go through excitation, excitation, contraction, coupling, contraction, and then relaxation. I'm going to tell you when relax relaxation actually occurred. Okay? So here we go. I just contracted it, now it's been relaxed. Notice that relaxation does not include going back to the original position. Relaxation is only the idea that the muscle no longer is producing tension. So you could touch my bicep, it's contracted right now, and then it relaxes. And you can feel sore. Because I'm just going to stop all the muscles around it. <laughs> so most people are like, oh, relaxation, and then this is relaxation. But in reality, contraction, and then that's relaxation. The, the uh, stoppage of the signal, it's not reverting it back to its original position. Reverting it back to its original position requires the antagonist muscle to go through contraction. So I guess for me to better understand it, so it's like you're like, like hmm, and then you just let it go. <laughs> kind of, it's kind of like that. I just try to make sense in my head. Yeah. I can't, I can't really picture it. So it's pretty loose right now. Okay, so you're, and you so can you see I can press like on this, it. And, and now it's going like to contract. It. And so it's contracted. It's still contracted. And now it's released. And it's all soft. But it hasn't reverted back to its original position. It's just no longer creating tension. No longer, it's no longer flexed. And the other thing, too, is that nerve signal leading to the biceps to help make, it, make that process occur. That nerve signal has been stopped as well. Okay, what do we do here? So excitation, this is our first phase of the four phases of muscle contraction. Excitation, and really, when we talk about these phases of muscle contraction, excitation, excitation, contraction, coupling, contraction, and relaxation, is referencing what is happening in the muscle cell. So excitation really doesn't begin until we have the acetylcholine receptors being stimulated. But for all intents and purposes, I typically conclude everything that's happening in the neuromuscular junction as part of excitation. So when I need to move a muscle, when I need to contract a muscle cell, it starts with the nerve impulse. And we've talked about how that nerve impulse, really briefly how it's formed, right? The nerve impulse is created by increases in sodium, and in, uh, or influx of sodium and outflow of potassium, creating that action potential. And that action potential moves along the membrane of the neuron until we get down here to the synapse. Then in the synapse, that change in voltage being generated by the nerve impulse causes the voltage-gated calcium channels to open. Okay. 
channel. So those nerve impulses come down, open up the calcium channel, and specifically it's the calcium channels that are in the synapse. So the synaptic knob calcium channels. All right, someone remind me, where is calcium highest in, uh, in the extracellular fluid? Which means it's lowest in intracellular fluid. So under those circumstances, calcium floods in or out into the nerve. Then we have a series of molecular interactions that lead to exocytosis. of acetylcholine. into the synaptic cleft. So exocytosis of acetylcholine vesicles is stimulated by the calcium that's just been let into the synaptic knob. So we have an increase in ACL, ACH in the synapse, and that increase in ACH in the synapse causes ACH to act as a ligand and to bind to the ACH receptor. So ACH binds to the ACH receptor. And again, these are in the sarcolemma. Someone remind me of what the sarcolemma is? I forgot. The cell membrane. The sarcolemma is the plasma membrane or the cell membrane of the muscle cell. How many acetylcholine receptors are required? I'm sorry. How many acetylcholine molecules are required for it? to activate a acetylcholine receptor? Deuce. So two acetylcholine uh, molecules must bind the receptor. That word right there is supposed to be receptor. So the two acetylcholine molecules must bind the receptor. And this particular receptor acts as an ion gated channel. And that ion gated channel, we're going to have sodium that rushes in to the cell. 